Welcome class. So today we are looking at general tests for evidence in this third lecture on critical thinking. We're going to look at how to best dissect evidence and come up with some standard criteria by which we can use as a process to help us process evidence a lot more effectively. So there are seven criteria that you want to use when you're using or when you're evaluating general tests of evidence. So the first one is accessibility. And the idea here is that can we see the evidence for examination? So a lot of times people will say like, there was this study that supported this and this. And you're like, well, what was this study? Like who did it? Where, you know, where was it published? How was the methods done? Well, I don't know. Well, then it's kind of not very good evidence because we, we can't access it, right? So the whole idea of critical thinking is that you can see for yourself and that you can take a claim and say, what's your grounds for this? Well, my grounds is X and you can see the grounds for yourself and you can say, ah, I've looked at your grounds. In this case, I've looked at the study that you were mentioning and yeah, it looks like, yeah, the study is supporting what you're saying. But a lot of times what happens is people will take a study and they'll kind of twist the findings or they'll twist the conclusion of the study and then they'll try to use it to support their claim. And then when you look at the study yourself, you're like, wait, the study doesn't actually say that. What it says is this, you see? So accessibility is, is a big piece of resolving disputes because when people are just making claims and then, but they're not sharing their evidence or giving evidence, then we're at a stalemate. Yes, this is true. No, it's not true. You kind of have the yaha, uh -huh, aha uh -huh debate, right? Like, uh huh, nah, uh, uh huh, nah, nah, uh. Nah. And so the way you advance is, okay, well, what's your evidence? And that's where we can start to have a dialogue. So, you know, there are obviously pragmatic considerations sometimes. Like, if you're having a drink with your friend and you're starting to have like a political debate, you won't have all this evidence just in your pocket that you can just supply at your own time. Now, of course, with phones, maybe that simplifies that a little bit more because maybe you can pull it up on your phone. But for the most part, people aren't prepared for that level of scrutiny and, and argumentation or that level of detail. But what you should at least be able to do is provide a citation, right? At least say like, well, I got it from the British Medical Journal or something like that. Because that at least adds a little bit of credibility and you have some idea of where it maybe came from. But, you know, you'll see a lot of people who are like, there are secret government documents that show that the government is supporting ISIS, you know, or something like that. But it's like, well, what are these secret documents? And so if you know about them, they're not really secret. And so we should be able to see these documents. Well, I can't get them because they're secret. Well, then how do you know what the secret documents say, right? So that's a whole thing about accessibility. The next is credibility. And credibility is basically, can we see the evidence as reliably saying something true? And so when you're dealing with credibility, you know, you're dealing with, is this actually something I can take for its word? All right. And there's usually two different little criteria under credibility that we can look at. And the, the first one is reputation, right? Reputation for accuracy. And reputation for accuracy is basically the idea that this publication has some kind of ch uh, checks and balances to make sure that it's actually saying things that are true, okay? The general way we do this is usually the publication should have some kind of peer review where other people who are experts in the field, not just any random person like, oh, my mom peer reviewed this. Um, it's usually peer review by two or three other people who know the field, who can then say, yeah, what this person is saying is pretty much true based on what I've studied. And then another person says, yeah, based on what I've studied too, I can see this being plausible as well. So when something doesn't have peer review of some kind, some kind of checks and balances, and it doesn't necessarily have to be journals per se, although those are the best because it's peer reviewed by people in the field. Even newspapers like the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, they have sort of a peer review because at least they have an editor. Now, the editor isn't necessarily an expert in the field, 
but at least there's some kind of checks and balances, so it's a little bit better. But the best kind is ones where before you can put anything in our book, two or three people have to look at it first to make sure you're not off your rocker. So the problem is that when people write blogs, okay, and they, you know, they have the global warming is fake blog, and so they can just kind of make whatever they want, there's no peer review for it. You see what I mean? So then you can just say whatever you want, or, you know, um, any kind of like medical science dispute, you know, alternative medicine blog, blah, blah, blah. All of those things, there's no peer review to it. So pretty much anybody can say what they want. It goes directly to publication, directly to the audience, and there's no kind of check and balance on it. So it just makes it less reputable for that reason. Now, a whole issue that comes into play that you'll see a lot in public discourse is the whole idea of payment. So what if you are paid by somebody to write something? So the thing is with payment, you don't want to get caught up in the genetic fallacy. So remember from fallacies last week, just because an argument comes from a certain person doesn't necessarily mean that it's false, okay? And when you're talking about like, you know, this person is paid by pro-drug industry people when they write this article, so we can't trust anything they say, well, it depends. If they're, they can still say true things about medical science. They can still say true things about the human body. So it's all about evidence at the end of the day. So because everybody gets paid, just as people who um, support traditional medicine get paid, so do people who support alternative medicine. So the argument can go both ways usually. So everybody has to make money somehow to survive. So really the question should come down to evidence. So even if one person is arguing X, and somebody on the other side is arguing why, and they're both paid by their respective interest groups, the way we resolve the, the debate isn't by who gets paid more or who's more likely to be credible or not, although credibility could be an issue. The, the better way to solve it is, well, what's your evidence, once again? So make the debate about evidence, don't make it about paychecks. The second thing, or the second aspect of credibility, so that's the little one, this is like the little two, Maybe I should make it like the A and the B's just to prevent confusion, is credentials. So this is where, okay, so I'm given some piece of evidence. I'm first off looking at where did it come from? So reputation for accuracy. Is this a blog? Is this a peer-reviewed journal? Is this a publication that's mainstream and has a process to it? So that's reputation. Credentials is, okay, now who is the writer? Because the reputation for accuracy is the process of the, of the whole publication. The credentials is now who is the specific author of this that's putting this out there. And so when you're looking at credentials, you're looking at education and expertise of the person. And, you know, usually we rely, people with extensive education on the topic or people with extensive experience on the topic, so... You could have a criminology professor or you could have somebody who was the director of, you know, crime reporting for 20 years for the Department of Justice writing something. And they're both equally credible in different ways, right? So the criminology professor, assuming he has no experience, but he might, um, the criminology professor will have a very good academic understanding of it, will understand theory quite well, and will be able to talk about things on a very deep level. The, the the director of the Department of Justice, he'll have a lot of personal experience, which is good, and so he'll have a lot of great examples and stories and so forth. Um, and so there's trade-offs to both, though, like being all academic, you have a lot of good theory, but you don't have a lot of practice. Being all experience, but no academics, you have a lot of practice, but you may not have as good of theory, or very limited theory, because you'll base everything on personal experience, and the world is bigger than your personal experience. But either way, there's at least some avenue of credibility either way you go. Now, the thing about degrees, especially PhDs, because I see this a lot too, whenever somebody claims to have a PhD, I mean, first off, make sure that they actually have it. Um, like John Gray, the guy who wrote Men from Mars, Women from Venus, didn't actually have a PhD, but that's a whole other issue. The, the bigger issue is when they claim they have a PhD, the next question you should ask is, in what? Because a lot of times what happens is people will get a PhD in something, but then go on to talk about something else that they didn't get their degree in. A good example is like Noam Chomsky. So Noam Chomsky, as you know, is a, as you might know, is an author, a political author, very, very um, kind of out there with his beliefs, if you will. And 
he has a PhD. And so the thing is, his PhD is in linguistics. So even though he's writing about foreign policy and all this stuff, his degree actually isn't in foreign policy or political science. It's in linguistics. And so technically, it's outside of his field. But we often do that even with physicists like Neil deGrasse Tyson. People will ask him questions about social justice and all that. I mean, he can speak on it, but he, that's not his field. His field is physics. So always, when you see PhD, the next question you should ask is, in what? So mine's in communication. So I think communication and critical thinking go well together. The next one is internal consistency. And this is making sure that the evidence does not contradict itself. So think of, think of um, accessibility and credibility being before you see the evidence, right? So this is just before you even read it. Okay, well, or on like first glance. Now what we're looking at is when you actually read the evidence itself. So internal consistency is evidence doesn't contradict itself. So basically the idea is that there shouldn't be any self-contradictions. Pretty, pretty straightforward. And a good example of this is like the Michael Brown shootings. So if you remember those from last year, that was the struggle between Michael Brown and Darren Wilson took place in St. Louis. And one of the problems after the... After the verdict was released, I actually listened to the, the press conference with, I believe it was the commissioner of the police who kind of explained what happened. Was it the commissioner or the prosecutor? I can't remember who it was, but they basically explained what happened in the trial. And like, this is where it went wrong for the prosecution. And one of the problems was witnesses contradicted each other. So the prosecution's case had a problem of internal consistency. Too many witnesses said different things. It's hard to know what happened. The next criteria is external consistency. And so this requirement is that the evidence is not in direct contradiction with either the majority of evidence from other sources or with the best evidence from other sources. So basically, the idea is that your, your, whatever evidence you have, it shouldn't be something that's contradicting by, uh, contradicting by other kinds of evidence, especially when that other kind of evidence is like a mainstream view or a widely accepted view. Now this gets interesting because sometimes the, the mainstream can be wrong about something. So we don't want to appeal to the bandwagon fallacy, but you know, it's one of those things where if, there's better evidence out there that contradicts it, or if there's an overwhelming number of studies that say this probably isn't true, then that's something to take into account. A great example is statistical studies. So <coughs> what will often happen is, you know, there'll be, there'll be a study that comes out that says like, I don't know, um, trying to think of an example. Oh, eggs are good for you. Okay. Let's just say that's one. <coughs> and so, What'll happen is, you know, there'll be a, one study that says we did a sample of 100 people and they ate eggs and they're healthier and they don't have cancer and they're cancer free. You know, the eggs cure their cancer. OK, let's just say that's what the study was. Now, um, let's say that there was a large number of studies that said actually eggs promote cancer. And I think that's actually what the case is. But let's just pretend that it is if it isn't. So let's just say like there's 100 other studies that say eggs promote cancer. So here's what'll happen, right? So somebody will be like, so five years ago, they were saying eggs were causing cancer. Now they're saying eggs prevent cancer. Why can't medical science make up its mind, right? And so what'll, what's, what's uh, missing here is that usually you don't base findings on just one study. And that's something that we're going to learn when you get to statistics the next week is that Usually with peer-reviewed journals and studies and all that, it's based on trends of studies, not just one study. One study usually doesn't change everything, okay? Usually it's a group of statistical studies that change things. So yes, there was a study here that says that, you know, eggs prevent cancer, but in the face of 50 other studies that say otherwise, unless this study did something totally different methodologically, did something totally revolutionary in terms of its design, it's probably just an anomaly compared to the 50 studies that say that they prevent cancer. So we would probably still stay with the mainstream because that's just one and you need more when you're doing statistical studies. So external consistency is about how does the other evidence shape up towards it? 
Um, and if you think of the Michael Brown shooting too, another thing that the prosecutor said was, you know, another problem that the, the case faced was that the, some of what the witnesses were saying that were consistent weren't consistent with the physical evidence. So the argument that the, the commissioner made, it's a really well done press conference, regardless of where you, you stand on that crime. Like, I don't know what actually happened. I'd have to look at the evidence myself, so I don't really have a strong opinion either way. But um, in terms of how the conference was done, the, the commissioner said that it starts with the physical evidence first because that's not prone to bias, right? The whole idea of physical evidence is that it's there. It doesn't change. It's, it is what it is. Testimony is something that can be prone to bias. People kind of change their stories, all of that. And so what he was saying was a lot of the witnesses, what they were saying wasn't physically possible based on the physical evidence. So the case also had external consistency problems as well. The fifth test is recency. And recency is the requirement that evidence be up to date, timely. So this gets complicated because Depending on the issue, timeliness matters more than others. So like if, for example, we're talking about is the economy improving and you say no because according to the New York Times of October 2013, well, 2013 was two years ago and that's a lifetime when it comes to economic health. So if I have evidence from last month versus your evidence from 2013, we're probably going to go at least on dates, you know, my evidence, right? Now, of course, other things to take into account, where did it come from, who wrote it, all that stuff, but to really make a strong claim about the health of the economy, you really need to have recent evidence, okay? Recent, recency has to be a major criteria for when you do that. Now, we also can't commit the fallacy of assuming that newer is always better, and the reverse of that, that older is always better than newer. So there's that whole fallacy. So again, you know, sometimes old ideas are still accepted and embraced today. So remember, there's geological findings that we've found, you know, hundreds of years ago, or at least 100 years ago, that we still use today. A lot of meteorology hasn't changed since 1800 or the 1500s even. A lot of the, the same concepts have not changed. So just because they're old doesn't necessarily mean they're bad either. So you have to look at context on recency because, you know, just because an idea is newer doesn't necessarily mean that it's accepted by everyone too, okay? So it just depends on the context for that one. The next one is relevance. So does has the evidence advanced any bearing on the argument's conclusion? So here, this is where you have to start. The Toolman model is very useful, right? So ask yourself, what's the claim? What's the grounds for that claim? And what's the warrant, okay? So, you know, a lot of times something will be missing in the article, in the study, in the person's opinion piece. I mean, whatever it is, there's going to be something missing or not well stated or just poorly established. Okay. So relevance is important. You know, an example is a lot of times people try to make comparisons between the animal kingdom and humans. And so they'll be like, in the animal kingdom, there's the alpha male and the alpha male leads the pack and takes all the resources and has all the mates. And in human society, there's the alpha male, you know, but there's also clear differences between like a wolf pack and how they operate and how our society operates with laws, norms, social customs, and all of that. And so, you know, when people try to use that kind of analogy or comparison, it doesn't work. And so, for every analogy, there's a disanalogy. Lastly, there's adequacy. Adequacy is whether the evidence is sufficient to support its claim. So this is where, once again, like, is it just one study? Like, is it just one little quote from somebody that maybe you've taken out of context? So this is where you have to look at the piece of evidence as a whole. Is this sufficient to support the claim that the person is making? Okay. One study, multiple studies, one person, three people. I mean, this is where you have to make that overall judgment. And like I said, a lot of times people use evidence as grounds, but it's not adequate to support the claim because the warrant is just not there or the warrant requires some kind of ridiculous assumption. So that's pretty much the general test of evidence. Use these for your assignments and in your everyday life.